Conferences are, about, are supposed to be about exciting things, new things, novelties, things that you can take away and bring in into your organization on the very next day and be excited about it. So uh, to be honest, this presentation will not be about the exciting things. It will be about painful reality and some war stories. Not a single particular war story, rather an amalgamation or several war stories. I hope you will enjoy it and actually uh, draw up some conclusions for yourself as well. My name is Sebastian Gemski. I'm a principal social architect. I work for a company called uh, Amazon Web Services. You have probably heard about us. Uh, I cooperate with startups in a whole uh, Europe, Africa, Middle East, and we do very exciting things with all kinds of startups, so with the, starting with the fledgling ones up to the ones who have already forgotten that uh, they were parting because they are unicorns. What's the plan for today? Uh, I will introduce you my friend, <laughs> mother of all databases. We will go through a fictitious scenario, so what has happened. And after the scenario, let me spoil it a little bit, after the scenario I will ask you whether you've experienced something similar. And I will ask you to raise your hand if you did. And I really hope you will, because otherwise I will look stupid. Okay, never mind. Uh, all right. Um, we will go through this fictitious scenario of some patterns and anti-patterns because some ideas are good, some ideas not really. And then I will provide you or I will suggest you some solutions. Those solutions will be strictly technology-based and probably some of you will call them workarounds because the real solutions to those problems are about the design, not really about the technology. So I will not you know, answer all the questions, but probably, hopefully this will be helpful. Uh, I will also show some demo uh, it's pre-recorded, so don't worry about some problems with connectivity or something. Uh, but it will, the idea is just to show you how, some, how simple some things are. Cool. So I've promised that I will start with a story. So a, a story is a story of a fictitious company. It started a few years ago, two, five, three, whatever. Uh, the company is quite successful. But it has started with building a new product. This is what's important. New product. They had an idea. They wanted to offer something to the customers. And of course, uh, they need to develop a, develop a system. Uh, usually when you develop a system, there's a lot of excitement. You pick your technology stack, and you agree to some conventions, and you start putting the code, and you start creating databases and so on. Uh, so the initial steps are very simple. Uh, you have the first entities. Uh, we need a user. <laughs> we need a contract, application. We need a, a basket we could put something in. We need a transaction whatever. So, uh, you typically, when you create such an entity as a class or something, you also model it in a database because you need to store the state. So initially, it's very simple. If you, for instance, follow, a, I don't know, maybe MVVM or MVC pattern, you just create a controller, you just create some sort of a model, you have something under the hood, and you typically use the technology you are familiar with or you would like to test, but hopefully you are pragmatic enough to really stick with what you are already familiar with. So uh, you typically pick a relational database. So for all of those entities, users, contracts, applications, you just create corresponding tables. Super simple. But after some time you realize that it's not actually that simple because some of those entities are super popular. For instance, entity called user. User is spread everywhere across the whole application. Because if you, for instance, change contract, there is the user, there is an owner of this contract, or the user that was the last one who has modified this contract, or the user who is the owner of this contract, or whatever. So the user is spread everywhere in your system. And every piece of functionality that performs the query against the database needs to join the user table. After some time, it's getting quite painful because the user becomes some sort of a coupling nest for your whole system, which was not the initial idea, and it's, it's starting to become a problem, but gradually. Initially, no one bothers. You know, it's just a join in the database, so who cares? But after some time, uh, the problem is that if you want to change something within your user table, then all of those places that use this table, they need to be adjusted as well. They need to be adapted. Imagine that you have, for instance, uh, the name, and there's just one field. And at some point, you want to split it into first name and surname. 
and it means that you need to plan to, to change plenty of controllers or change or plenty of domain services internally that are using this data structure in, in their queries. Actually, after some time, you will also notice the different problem that as your complex as your functionality gets more complex and complex, your queries that you have, the business queries that do something, they actually join more and more tables because you get more and more dimensions of complexity. For instance, let's imagine that you have some kind of e-commerce site. So initially you have the table with prices, but after some time, the, a smart business person told you that you need to apply discounts. And at some point they've realized that there are different kinds of discounts. There is a percentage discount, there's a flat discount, maybe there's a volume-based discount. It's get more tricky. At some point they realize, oh my God, there are also taxes. <laughs> We've forgotten to implement taxes. And this is actually also a part of the, of the price. So we need to add it somehow. At some point uh, there are some rebates, sales, plenty of different things. And of course you need to accommodate them somehow. So it means that even the basic functionality has to reach out to plenty of tables. And that's the result. As a result, you have a mesh. After, of course, after some time, after a few years, you have plenty of tables which are in a nearly infinite space. And each of them is used in very random places within your system. At one point, I've joined an organization which was eight years long, uh, old, sorry, uh, eight years old, and I just did some uh, scanning across their databases and their code bases as well, and I found out that there were single functions that were using up to 200 tables. Single function was using 200 tables. And on the other hand, there were tables used by 250 functions. And everything was in one single cluster, you know, in one single bundle, which was not splittable, not modular at all. And it was not comprehensible at all. At this moment, when there was a new business idea and something was supposed to be implemented, they didn't know where to start. And they had problems with taking the responsibility because they didn't know whether maybe there is some table with some crucial information somewhere there that we should take under consideration uh, when we implement this functionality. So typically what you do when you have this huge monolith, regardless of whether it's services or database, you, for instance, apply the struggler pattern. So you try to you know, create a layer of abstraction or you want to try to find out something which is relatively less connected to the rest of the world. In this case, it was not possible. It was one huge tangle of data which depends on each other and which is very strongly correlated. It was a huge issue. Uh, at some point, uh, of course, it's not only about the complexity, but it's also about the data that you accumulate within those tables. That if your business is really successful, over the years you use more and more and more and more, of course those data structures weren't really designed to actually grow up to this level. And this, be this really becomes the problem, because you had no archive strategy, you had no partitioning strategy, you had no sharding strategy, no tenancy strategy, and at some point you have tables which grow to 50 million records or something, or even bigger, and it becomes a problem because it's used in, in the most popular uh, operation across the whole system. Uh, another problem that happens over the years is that some structures, some data structures, were optimized for a certain paper purpose. But after some time, you are bringing in completely new functionality, and this functionality would like to access this data in a different way. So the way you have designed your data structures, it was optimized for the old functionality, but the new functionality really struggles. And you know, you create all those fancy queries which take two screens, uh, and they are super complex, and you are happy that you've solved this puzzle, but in the end, is it maintainable at all? It's a huge problem. But you're happy because you've ticked off the task and you know, another piece of functionality is deployed. But what about tomorrow? Tomorrow we'll bring a very similar case. Uh, if you want a simple illustration, uh, think about so-called two-sided marketplaces. Are you familiar with the idea of two-sided marketplace? 
Not really. Okay, so for instance, uh, do you know Etsy? Etsy basically is a two-sided uh, two marketplace. So on one side, we have those people who create all those fancy things they sell. And what we give them as a platform, as, Etsy, as the owners of Etsy, is some sort of a SaaS, software as a service. We give them software to run their business. So what they use Etsy for is to maintain their offer, their pricing, their everything. We just provide them the system. But within the system, they work only with their own data. They have their own clients, they have their own transactions. They run their business using this piece of, this, of the software. On the other hand, because I said that it's two-sided marketplace, so there has to be a second side. <laughs> so on the other hand, there's a marketplace. So there's a random person somewhere in the world who's just looking for something, who'd like to buy something. And this person doesn't just browse an offer or a single merchant. No, this person browses the whole marketplace, all the merchants, because this person doesn't know who will it buy it, uh, this thing from? This person is maybe looking for something, I don't know, pearl earrings or whatever. So, uh, if you think about it, and, uh, and of course there's something in the middle, and this something in the middle that joins those two uh, sides is the transactions. Because if actually someone buys stuff on Etsy, there's a transaction that connects the merchant, so it's on the selling party, with the buying party, with the, with the customer. So why do I mention this particular example? Think about the queries that, ha that has to be implemented for both of those sides of this marketplace. If you are the merchant, all of those queries will run only across your data, your private data as the merchant. So your transactions, your offer, your prices, your stuff. But if you are a marketplace user, or if you are creating the functionality for the marketplace user, the queries will be theoretically browsing the same tables if you design it so. However, they will be fundamentally different because you will browse uh, the whole marketplace, the whole offer, the whole everything, but you will look for explicit things, for instance, the pearl earrings. So, is it possible, is it even possible to create, to design such data structures that will actually implement both of those sites in a very efficient manner? It's a good question. To be honest, no. <laughs> At some scale, no. You have to be smarter than that. You have to apply very smart techniques to actually do that. So, uh, sooner or later, you find out that your super successful five-year-old system has those hundreds of tables which are super interdependent, interconnected. Uh, it's so complex that it's above the level of uh, the cognitive load for an average developer or average person in general, and you are in trouble. Uh, you are in trouble because the problems start to cascade. So what, what could we do? So let me be super honest with you. I already said that in the beginning. This is a design problem, not a technology problem. It doesn't mean, if you, if you at this point encounter performance issues, it's because you've designed it in the wrong way, not because your Postgres, MySQL, or whatever is, is a sheet of a database. No, no, it's a design problem. So if you, if you get up to these problems of scale, so you are successful, congratulations, but you have other problems of scale or the complexity, uh, you need to design in a way that is adjusted to this new level of complexity. But during this presentation, I will not tell you anything about the design, so how to deal with those, those problems by applying correct design, functional design, domain-driven uh, design, and so on. No. The idea is that I will tell you how the technology can help you cheat a little bit. <laughs> so what are the work technical workarounds that can buy you some time or at least uh, make some problems less painful so you have time to apply proper design? Great. Uh, so just to uh, reiterate a little bit, uh, the problem of those things accumulating in time, they manifest in two ways. As performance issues and com as uh, complexity issues. Why as performance issues? Uh, because we have, for instance, data structures which are optimized for different kind of functionality than the one that we are building right now. Uh, because, for instance, we are using the same single data structures for both online and offline processing, so for reporting and for typical OLTP. So that's the performance side. 
And why complexity? Well, of course, if uh, you have such tangled mess of all of those data tables and data structure, it's hardly comprehensible, it's not modular. You have a problem with ownership, how to split it? Even between the teams, if everyone ca can use anything, if anyone can join any table. So, uh, what typically this is what we start with. So we have some application which is running within compute resources and it's using uh, this master database or a single database, single relational database. That's how many successful products have started. Of course, at some point, typically uh, because of uh, microservice hype and because we are getting building more and more teams, because we are successful, right? We have somehow split the code base. So we, for instance, create all those new microservices. But they still refer to one single database because it's easier. And then maybe we even adopt serverless. And those Lambda functions still refer to this one single database, which is kind of plainly stupid. Why so? Uh, because there's, an, of course, an issue with connections. So that's the first issue that you encounter. And you wonder why. Because you have, I don't know, 10,000 lambdas trying to uh, uh, get a new connection to a one single database. So actually, the workaround for this issue is very simple. Use a smart proxy. So in this case, you can use RDS proxy, which is just uh, what it's doing is pulling the connections. And it also helps with the failover. So it makes it more seamless, and it makes it uh, to last a little bit shorter. And uh, it's the way it, it's able to multiplex is, for instance, it can manage tens of thousands of connections. And from the perspective of database, it will be 200 or 100. Because, of course, each connection, from the perspective of a database, it's something that increases the load. So, it, so that's one thing. That was the easy one. So uh, that's the typical uh, implementation of naive microservices. So the company thinks that they have microservices, but they do not. So uh, what you can see here, there are some compute resources, there are some processes running on them, and they call each other. Every of those uh, pieces of functionality is responsible for something, for some functional area. But under the hood, they are still referring to the same database. And then people are quite happy because they think, all right, we've achieved it. We have those microservices. But still, it's the same database. You will have exactly the same problems. Uh, so uh, another idea, uh, which is st it's still naive microservices, it's not really real microservices, if is when you actually are able to somehow split your database into few separate databases. But the problem is that they have really different, kinds, uh, different uh, sets of data. So th this data doesn't overlap. So for instance, the user table is only in one of those databases. So it means that if you need somehow to access the data about the user, you need to call from your microservice, you need to call another microservice, and this one will reach out for the user data. So it means that you have a super fragile, absolutely synchronous communication across something that can very easily get out of control. So that's another bad idea. Uh, some companies can afford that, and that's actually not a bad idea. It's the really real multi-tenancy. So they duplicate their whole structure. They have like a pretty separate set of services and databases for each production. So for instance, if you are a big B2B company and you, you, you serve some big customers, you can have a completely separate infrastructure for all of them. In some cases, it makes sense. Uh, of course, it means that you have some additional op operational overhead on uh, keeping those things up to date or on applying the changes. But still, in some cases, at least from the pers performance perspective or security perspective, it makes sense. Uh, that's something that many companies are implementing, and it also makes sense, but it can be quite tricky. It's uh, physical sharding. So what you're doing here, you're actually not separating the compute infrastructure. So you have applications which are shared for all your customers, but you are separating data on the level of the database. So uh, you, for instance, have geographically separate databases which have data only for particular geography, for particular tenant, for particular language, country, whatever. 
And what you need is you need some sort of dispatcher logic within your application to actually route your traffic, to route your queries to a particular shard. That may be quite tricky. But it's in general, for many geographically distributed applications, it makes sense. Think about Uber, for instance. Uber is running within cities. There are, uh, I don't know many cases when you've started your Uber ride in one city, but you ended up 200 kilometers away. To be honest, I don't think it's simple. It's, it's possible. These are like completely different separate charts. And that also helps uh, if you want to keep the uh, performance under control. Uh, that's another pattern, and this one is tricky. Why so? Uh, because it uses the multi-master database. So it means that the, uh, the database is clusterized, and each of the nodes is a master node. So each of the nodes accepts both read and writes. And the main issue is that there are very few relational SQL databases that handle this, if you think about it. They are quite specific. For instance, uh, there's a database like this in, uh, in AWS. It's called uh, Aurora Global Database. Uh, it's quite tricky, and it has limitations. And it comes only in MySQL flavor. And it has also limitations how big it can scale. But it's also possible. So uh, typically, when the company is uh, investigating this scenario, and they want something like this, but they realize that there are not that many options, they go for something like that. So they try multi-master database, which is not relational. <laughs> So that's why we have some successful businesses, or more or less successful, that are, for instance, running their main OLTP database. Uh, as, as their main OLTP database, they have Cassandra, or even worse, uh, MongoDB. But that also happens. Uh, I'm not saying MongoDB is a bad database, but uh, maybe not for this particular purpose. All right. Uh, yeah, so uh, MongoDB or Cassandra is just one example. Uh, actually, you should use a database which is optimized for a particular purpose. And there are, of course, plenty of options of managed databases. Uh, but uh, probably this is the better way than the previous one. So uh, for a particular purpose, use the database which is optimized for this single purpose. So of course, you can still stick your mother of all DBs, so your one big, huge uh, database that is used to keep, for instance, your, I don't know, business parameterization, transactions, customers, whatever. Uh, but for instance, for uh, if you use e event storming in part of your system, you could use time series database to keep the events. Or if you b are building some sort of social network, you could use a graph-oriented database. So that's also something that happens. Uh, the next solution uh, is the most popular one. It's sometimes it's called everyone first reporting solution. So uh, what's it about? It's just about creating the replicas. So we still have one master database, but this master is creating several replicas, and those replicas can be used for reporting. That's obvious. But it can be, they can also be used for some uh, actually transactional processing as well. Because for instance, think about software that you create a uh, marketplace software, or a software to sell you know, tickets for some popular geeks. Think about the traffic split. So how many of the queries to your database are reads, and how many are writes? Probably writes are very, very few. The reads are the problem, because you are constantly asking about the current state. So maybe the idea is to have a very fast replication, and have many read-only replicas to handle the read traffic, because the right traffic is not an issue. And the problem is, the only problem is how to achieve the fast replication. So fortunately, you can cheat a little bit. And uh, I'm not sure whether you know how the successful cloud products are born. <laughs> it's quite a long story. So if you want the whole story, you can ask me in the corridor. But in general, uh, sometimes one of the ways is you pick the good open source product. And as you, ask, uh, you are a cloud provider, you use your superpowers of controlling the infrastructure. And that's what happened when uh, Amazon has created Aurora. So what's Aurora? Aurora is basically an open source database as a foundation, either MySQL or Postgres. But it has been sliced to separate the compute from the storage. And they are completely separately scalable, completely separately uh, managed, completely separately uh, even build <laughs> everything. So for instance, you can uh, pretty much with zero additional overhead 
have up to 15 read replicas without the affecting the actual queries that are running on your, mer on your main database. That's, that, that's one of the things that can help you. Uh, it even comes in the, in the serverless flavor. So, uh, of course, serverless in this case, uh, you know, uh, server, uh, database is not a lambda function. So it means that you need to keep the state. So it's not something that will perish in a moment. So I would say that it's more dynamic or it's more adjustable or flexible than serverless. All right. Uh, but let's imagine that in your case, the disparity between reads and writes is not that massive. So it means that you still have many rights, and you need to somehow handle them. So what are the other options? Uh, the other options, which is supported by many databases, is write forwarding. So you can have a cluster, and the cluster is a typical relational database. And of course, you can you have only one master and some replicas, but the replicas have the capability of forwarding the write. So from the perspective of someone who is using the database, it doesn't master, matter which node are you uh, trying to interact with, because you can send both writes and reads to the, to the nodes, and it will work. Uh, and if you are really smart or have a really smart proxy, like here, uh, you can actually hide your database behind this proxy. And it's the proxy that will decide which operations send where. And then you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't even have to have write forwarding. It can be the proxy that does all the routing. So from the perspective of someone who creates the functionality or writes the code, you have a huge, massive database, which in fact is not a single database. It's some writer and some reader nodes that can scale pretty much indefinitely. For instance, for the serverless database, it was up to 60 read replicas. OK, uh, so let's see very, very briefly how does this hiding of the complexity look, uh, look uh, in practice. So here's a cluster. It's a raw cluster with three replicas. And does it mean that I will be connecting to a particular replica? I will have to have a replica assigned or something like this? Actually, no. I have defined endpoints. I have write endpoint, uh, writer endpoint and reader endpoint. And reader endpoint hides all the complexity of all the read replicas that I spawn. And it doesn't matter where they are. It doesn't matter whether they are in the same region, the multi uh, availability zone. It doesn't really matter. So when I... Uh, I can check the properties here just to see that uh, yeah, it's in the uh, actual uh, address. So you can see what kind of endpoint I'm accessing. And you contact to those endpoints in the very same way. You can, query, you can send the queries in the very same way. Uh, the general idea is that they are pretty much um, they are synchronously replicated. So this replication is super fast. As I'm querying just one table, the table contains the bank nodes. So when I uh, access the writer node, I can, of course, insert the data. But if I, in a moment, uh, try to run the same query against the reader node, I will get an error. So uh, if I use this most simple way, and I have abstracted my uh, read replicas behind the endpoints, that's one thing I have to remember, that I have two endpoints, two separate endpoints. I, 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 I need to know which one I'm trying, I need to address, I need to use at this point. So it's, uh, I need to understand my operation, whether my operation will be a mutating one or not really. And of course, I can check the IP address of my node. And in case of the read replicas, uh, if I execute the same query, uh, which checks the IP address a few times, I actually have the same address, uh, because which replica I'm using is uh, determined at the moment of creating the connection. So I need to reconnect, and when I reconnect, I may get a different replica. So that's how it works. It's the simplest scenario, but uh, there are more interesting ones. For instance, uh, a handle proxy, which is available on AWS Marketplace, is one of those smart proxies that hides the complexity of the endpoints. So you have just one endpoint. And it's smart enough to actually understand what you are trying to do, whether you are trying to issue a mutating operation or just reading operation. So from the perspective of the end user or from the functionality, it's actually one huge database that can grow, which is still relational, and it can grow pretty much indefinitely. 
and it's of course managed. So you don't have to patch it, you don't have to run it by yourself. Okay, uh, what about something even better? Uh, it's just a very oversimplified diagram, so please do not uh, uh, peek uh, in the details. The general idea is that you finally have a solution with a clear data ownership. What does it mean? It means that you create a microservice which owns its data exclusively, but it's able to publish its data for everyone else so they can build their own read perspectives for their own sake. So it means that, for instance, user is publishing its information into some sort of a distributed transaction log, like Kafka, and everyone can read this information and maybe later join it or use it for whatever else, but it's just a replica. So that's the way to actually split it into uh, some sort of uh, modules or some sort of uh, areas that really own their data, but they can use the data of the other modules in a read-only manner. Uh, it's tricky. Uh, typically, how we do it, or how we cheat it, <laughs> is that we just use CDC, so we just replicate the data. Of course, the better way is to create business events, meaningful business events. But like I said earlier, as the design technique, and today I'm not talking about the design techniques, I'm talking just about cheating the whole stuff with that technology. So uh, we have the CDC stream. CDC, change data capture, so it's the stream of all the changes on the, in the source database. And then we do something with that. And this can be tricky, because those operations can be tricky. There may be an operation that truncates the database. There may be an operation that adds a column or removes some, some rows from the database. And you need somehow to replicate it and then to apply it, to apply it on your read-only local repositories. That can be really tricky. How, how, how can we solve this in a simple way? Unfortunately, in many cases, we do this by, our sense, by, by ourselves, by hand. <laughs> and that's not the best way, because there are tools that are really ready to do that. So uh, that's the simplest possible pipeline. Uh, in, in you, on the left, you have a relational database. In this case, Aurora. So from your perspective, it can be MySQL or Postgres or whatever. And then you have something which is called DMS. Uh, what is this data migration service? It's actually not really ab only about migration. It's a wrapper. It's not a product that was built from scratch. It's a wrapper on pretty much all kinds of replication techniques which are natively implemented in the databases. So it has a very pluggable architecture. For instance, if imagine that the source is Postgres. So it knows what kind of uh, replication techniques and tools Postgres provides, for instance, PG logical, and it wraps it in more generic, let's say, framework, then allows you some transformations. So it pretty much takes this data into the target location or locations, which again can be uh, specific for the target database. So it's some sort of a managed wrapper for doing all kinds of migrations, all kinds of data migrations. And yeah, in this particular case, what it's doing, it's taking CDC data, so change data capture data, from the source database, and it's pushing it into an event stream. Uh, event stream in this case is called Kinesis Data Stream. It works in a similar way to Kafka. So why it's not Kafka? Uh, Again, it's the story about successful data services. Another way to be the successful data service is to have a huge business like Amazon.com, implement something internally, see it, wow, it's really good. We could actually expose it. <laughs> Maybe someone will actually buy it from us. Uh, so that's the way uh, Kinesis Data Stream has, has, was created. It's a serverless event stream that scales seamlessly. And it's like an alternative to Kafka, which is less popular and which is proprietary to uh, AWS. So anyway, uh, that's how you take the, take the changes from Aurora, push them through migration service into the stream, and later apply any kind of logic that you want in Lambda. For instance, in this case, to write this data down into DynamoDB. So what do we have here? We have the changes somehow stored in another database as some sort of read-only replica, which is optimized for the needs of the target microservice, area, whatever. 
There are plenty of ways to do this. This one is a little bit more complex. It's pretty much the same architecture. The main difference is that you can have a dynamic partitioning. A dynamic partitioning means that, for instance, you can pretty much reorganize your database because you can do partitioning uh, by using different criteria than the initial ones. So initially, they may have been some tables which were dedicated, I don't know, to user, contract, application, whatever. But here you can do partitioning based on the tenant, customer, because you will build whole objects. For instance, this is all data related to my customer XYZ, regardless of whether it was user, transaction, application, or whatever. Another interesting option is, uh, for instance, you can use a service called Glue, which is pretty much Spark under the hood. So it means that you can use Spark streaming to actually tr transform this data on the go, pretty much on the go, because it's more micro-batching than event streaming. But you can do that as well. And this opens even more possibilities. Why so? Because, for instance, you can incorporate some machine learning if you want. So, for instance, some recommendations. And then you have your read-only views, which are enriched with some additional information. And, of course, if you are a Kafka aficionado, you can do the same thing using uh, Debezium, for instance. Uh, under the hood of uh, Kafka Connect. And also through MSK, which is serverless Kafka, you can push it wherever you want. For instance, in this case, into, uh, by the connector into DynamoDB. So uh, let me show you how it works in, works in practice, how easy it is. Because in general, if you really want to implement it on your own, you can. But you need to make it highly available because, you know, if it stops replicating the data, if it stops refreshing the views, then you are doomed. <laughs> and it may actually get, get quite complex in time. So uh, let me show you some example. Example is very simple. Uh, it's about money. So uh, there are notes, bank notes. So for instance, $10, 5 zlotys, 10 pounds, whatever. And a wallet has a, a note has its own perspective. So each note is uniquely identified. Because you may have in your pocket two notes, which each of them is 10 zlotys. But they are different nodes, because you have two of them. But there is also the perspective of a wallet. For instance, if someone asks you, how many zlotys do you have? You don't tell them, uh, I have two, two nodes of 10 zlotys, 50 nodes of 50 zlotys. No, no, no. You just tell them, I have 1,100 zlotys. So these are two different perspectives on the same data. So let's try to implement the first perspective in SQL. And then let's try to transfer the data into read-only database, uh, but on in the second perspective, in the perspective of the wallet. Brilliant. So uh, we have only one replica in this case. Uh, only it's, it's, it's just, uh, just a writer instance, to be honest. It's not even a replica. And uh, just to show you, uh, we also have DynamoDB, which is, is supposed to be a target. And this DynamoDB has the table named wallet, and it's, it's empty. So let's get back into our relational database, and let's query the table notes. This is the source table where we keep the bank notes, and it's empty. We don't have anything here. So why don't we put one note? One note, USD, $10, yes. And right now, obviously, we have just this one note. Uh, so it's quite simple, one note, $10. At this point, if we refresh uh, what's in the Dynamo, we have the same information. So the pipeline, I will show you the pipeline in a moment. The pipeline works. So we have transferred the information on the go from one database to another. Uh, let's try to insert more nodes in the source table, so in our Aurora. So we have more nodes. It's still dollars, but it should be 30 right now, because we have two nodes, 10 and 20. Yes, it's 30. All right, let's try to add some more, just to, and maybe something even more tricky. Let's change the currency. So let's find out whether it will add up with dollars. Let's hope it doesn't. All right, we have three nodes. Bet to Dynamo. And in Dynamo, we have two sums, because we have separate sum for dollars, we have separate sum for uh, Polish Zwartis. Brilliant. What about, for instance, if we try to update the note, the note with a particular identifier? Would it update the final result in Dynamo as well? 
the hint, it will, in just a moment. Yep, it gets updated. So the logic is, is, is super simple, uh, but let's see how it is implemented. So we have this particular instance, and the instance is the source of the information, of CDC information. So in the DMS console, we have just one migration task, which is moving the data. And in the details of this particular task, we see that there is a source, and the source is exactly the instance we were talking about, and there's a target. Let's, tr let's see what the target is. What's the target? Yeah, so the target is actually a stream, the serverless stream, Kinesis stream, which pushes the events forward to Lambda, which is doing something with those streams. You can see Kinesis here are, are the source of the, for the Lambda. So each time uh, there is a detected movement within the stream, the Lambda is getting triggered. Actually, Lambda is super simple, uh, because what it does, it uses the bottle free uh, SDK, so a Python SDK, to actually r write the data down into DynamoDB. It's just a very standard sample, nothing really fancy. Yeah, it just uses the uh, module for DynamoDB in Boto3. But what we can do here is we actually can check some logs just to find out what was the input for the Lambda. Because this is the interesting part. Because the input for the Lambda is supposed to be the CDC event. So what is the CDC event in this case? You can see it here as a JSON. That you have some data and you have some metadata. In the data, you have the, in the metadata, you have the information about, uh, for instance, timestamps, so when was the operation performed, what kind of operation was it, because it was the update. And in data, you have the actual new values in the record. So you have all this information about transaction, and it's, g it's given as an input for your Lambda functions. So it means that then it's up to you how you compose the code, how you use it to actually update the final data structures. All right. So uh, these are just a few techniques, which are very, very technical. And the general idea is to... Uh, to know what, which technique to apply and which will make some sort of a difference, you need to understand your, your case. You need to understand your traffic. So, for instance, the split between the reads and the writes. Or uh, the, your traffic, is it stable or does it change over the time? And what about, uh, for instance, some patterns that, that actu actually also can happen? And what kind of consistency do you expect when you are querying the data? Uh, another important point is that uh, redundancy is actually not so bad. So a smart application of replicas or smart application of those read-only views can actually save you or give you some time if you need to redesign your general database. Or they are smart in uh, not only if you need to redesign, but they are smart just to offload some traffic that can be offloaded. Uh, the biggest problem probably here is not really performance, it's the coupling. Because if you have something that uh, is, is not really modular, it's just ac access from everywhere, it's accessed all the time, and there is no clear owner, at some point, you will have a regression. Or each change will have to be tested for literally for weeks. Because otherwise, uh, you, will, you will really risk some changes that will be disrupting, that will be breaking the functionality. Uh, if you want to read a little bit more, about the split on the level of the database as well, not only on the level of the actual functionality, I mean microservice uh, code, uh, feel free to take a look at those two uh, books. They are actually quite interesting, and they really address it quite well, so, so you can understand the problems before you really encounter them. If you want to experiment with some of those techniques I've mentioned, so for instance, with using the CDC, uh, to replicate the data, or with uh, pr proxying, using a smart proxy to actually split the traffic, or, or to avoid splitting the traffic, uh, feel free to uh, take a look at these materials. And thank you very much. Uh, if you'd like to ask some questions, it's a good moment right now. Or if you want, you can, of course, uh, either use the contact information that is provided on screen, or uh, just encounter me at the uh, corridor. I will be happy to answer any questions uh, there as well. So, 
Do you have any questions? I have a question about the ordering. The ordering. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the ordering between the CDC events and uh, Kinesis. Uh, mm -hmm. you know it's actually Kafka under, uh, under the hood. No, no, there's no Kafka under Kinesis. So similar technology, mm -hmm. probably. So uh, what is the actually, uh, mm, because the, I found the CDC events as uh, events, like a JSON, you, you, you show it, and they are pretty much decoupled from each other, right? Yeah. So how mm -hmm. you are going to uh, uh, um, uh, make these events to appear in the same order in the Kinesis site? Mm -hmm. OK. So uh, this question has few separate answers, I mean parts of the answer. So the first part is the actual ordering on the level of the mechanism that creates CDC. So for instance, DMS in this case. So this, this mechanism is responsible for sending the information, sending those CDC events in order. And how is it guaranteed? It's guaranteed by the actual mechanis mechanism which is under the hood. For instance, uh, wait, uh, uh, WAL, or for instance, uh, PG logical or whatever. But this is the part of the solution. Exactly, because you have the network. stream. We have a network of course. Mess up everything. Yes. And that's why we have the second part of the problem or the, or the solution. So uh, if you create a stream, and I think it works pretty much for in the same way for all the um, stream technologies and so on, uh, you have pretty much the option. One option is just accept it in any way you want, and it's your responsibility to use the timestamps or whatever which is in the source to actually do the ordering. So for instance, you can do some buffering, and you can do some assumption, I can wait X, but not more. And of course, this is the high performance option, because it means that there is no locking within the mechanism. Maybe even not even locking, but no, no synchronization because this is a distributed uh, event streaming system. However, there's also an option that does it for you. So for Kinesis, you can use FIFO kind of a stream which has this guarantee, which provides this guarantee. So in how it does? How it does under the hood? How it's implemented? Yes, this is very. <laughs> Well, uh, you cannot see that in the in the code because this is not open source. It's a proprietary solution. But you you know pretty much it, it's it's quite straightforward. It has to synchronize the state somehow. There have to be some bookmarks, and also uh, there probably have to be some validations of how much time you have to check, because there is no okay, maybe there is some sort of a uh, temporary state where you have some sort of a map. Well, it's it's hard to speculate to be honest. I don't know how it's implemented exactly. But there is a version which is called FIFO, which gives you that guarantee. If you don't want to take this responsibility on yourself. Hi. Uh, I have a question about the data replication pipeline that you presented. Uh, while it certainly solves many problems, um, it looks pretty complicated to me. And what I'm interested in is that you move the data around, yeah, you move a lot of data around. Isn't this like crazy expensive with AWS? The point is that that's why you have Aurora 4. <laughs> Did you ask this question for a reason? Did I, did I ask you before to ask this question? No, because I, I'm, I'm joking. The uh, general idea is if you have this uh, split between the compute layer and the storage layer, the actual distribution of the data uh, within the storage layer, it's automatic. If you just create those replicas and you are, you're not paying for replicating this data, you're not paying for this transfer, you're just paying for the replicas. There's, I don't even remember the pricing. But in general, it doesn't mean, this is the important fact, that it doesn't mean that if you add another replica, for instance, the second one, your traffic or some sort of delay grows. It, it doesn't increase. It's, it doesn't change anything from the perspective of the actual operations that are coming from the, from the functionality and user or whatever. So this, that's not an issue. That, that may be an issue in the not cloud native database, which is not really optimized for such a model. But that's why we have those cloud databases, which already take this under consideration. Uh, OK, thank you. Sure thing. All right, so we are out of time. 
Thank you very much. If you have any more questions, feel free to approach me at the corridor. Thank you.